So now we have some means of quantifying the effects of perturbations. Let's go back and think again about how a problem is just an abstract function from data to the solutions. And then on a machine, we're going to implement some kind of algorithm, which I'll now call f tilde. And f tilde maps that data to some other point in your solution space. So the question that we're most likely to want to know, first of all, is, is the result of the algorithm close to the true solution of the problem? So here's an example that we um, started with in the last section. Let's let the problem be finding the roots of a quadratic polynomial. So the data in this problem are the coefficients a, b, and c, and the solution are the two roots that we compute. So here's an example choosing a, b, and c. And these are chosen so that the two roots are exactly 10 to the 6th and 10 to the negative 6. Our algorithm will be to do floating point arithmetic for the quadratic formula. The larger root we get exactly right, 10 to the 6. But you'll notice that the smaller root only has about 5 or 6 accurate digits in it. Whenever we see a large change in the answer due to small errors, we ought to ask, could this be due to a large condition number? Well, last time we worked out what this condition number is, and the denominator of it has the difference between the two roots. These two roots are very well separated, and so in fact kappa is very small. So conditioning of the original problem isn't the issue. It has something to do with our algorithm. So if we think about what's going on in this problem, negative b is very close to 10 to the 6th, and b is also much larger than a and c, and so that square root is also pretty close to 10 to the 6th. And so what we're doing is we're subtracting two nearby numbers and expecting them to cancel out to give us something close to 10 to the minus 6. That, of course, is the situation of subtractive cancellation. With a small change, we can fix the algorithm. So we can use the same method as before to get the first root, which was perfect, and then by using an identity from the quadratic formula, we can find the second root using only multiplication and division. They don't suffer from sensitivity, and so this answer turns out to be perfect as well. A situation like this, in which we get an answer that's much less accurate than the condition number can explain, we call an unstable algorithm. Very often, instability arises from doing an avoidable ill-conditioned step in the algorithm. One way to think about this formally with the math is if you think about composing two functions, f and g, then the condition number of the composition, applying one function and then the other, obeys something very much like the chain rule for derivatives. It's the product of the condition numbers of the two steps. So even if the composed function ought to be well conditioned, if one of those steps isn't, we could end up with a large condition number. That's what happened in the example above. We did a subtraction that caused a cancellation that it turns out we could have avoided by doing it through another means. Stability is a major issue throughout numerical computing, and there are various technical definitions of it. We don't want to get lost in all those details. But there is one other important thing to know about it and how to try to measure it. It turns out that instead of asking, is the result of the algorithm close to the correct result, we're going to look at it backwards. Whatever result we get from the algorithm, from f tilde, there must have been some data on the other side 
that would give us that as the exact solution. In other words, did we solve a problem for data that's close to the original data? Not just did we get close to the right answer, but did we answer something close to the right question? This difference between the original data and the data that it would take to get the answer we saw is called the backward error. Ideally, the best algorithms can keep the backward error small, even when the forward error can't be controlled because of ill conditioning. So to close this idea out, let's look at another polynomial root problem. In this case, we're engineering it so that the roots really are close together. In fact, they're separated by 10 to the minus 7. And so therefore, the condition number of the roots is 10 to the 7. And so we expect that there's going to be a growth of 7 orders of magnitude compared to machine precision. Even if we compute them stably, that's the best we can do. So naturally, the forward error is about 10 to the 7th times 10 to the minus 16. To find the backward error, we're going to find the data, in other words, the polynomial, that produced the roots we actually saw. In MATLAB, there's a command called poly that does this. So this is the x tilde that's in the abstract picture above. And then the backward error is the difference between that polynomial and the one we started with. It turns out that we actually got exactly the same polynomial. So it's a bit of a paradox. Even though the forward error is wrong in terms of the exact numbers, we did solve the problem for the floating point representations of that polynomial. That's the best we can do.